dudes. Dudes. Welcome to a very special video entitled Carter Beaufort shares his doodly drumming wisdom while I sit here and hyperventilate in disbelief. <laughs> Let's begin. Your career is the gold standard of health and longevity and speaking a million musical languages. And you've played for a bunch of artists I'm really curious about. Big Nick Nicholas and Blue Indigo, there's Secrets. Wow. And your residency on BET on jazz. When you think about that era of your drumming life, what was the mentality, what were your goals on the drums at that time? Back then it was just uh, trying to maintain a gig. <laughs> you know, and, and, and sounding not too repetitive because a lot of stuff most musicians do. I mean, someone has always done it before. But you try and make it sound a little more interesting than the person before you, which is almost impossible to do when you have to follow up what Tony Williams did, you know, it's kind of hard to do that. But yeah, you know, it's one of those things that you have to just maintain, you know, keep that focus and just try to make the music speak in such a way that's going to be interesting for the listener. And that's what I focus on the, the most with all those guys that I played with, you know, it's like I just wanted to do something that didn't sound too repetitive and it worked. So <laughs> No doubt, man. Do you feel that in the years since then your relationship with the drums has changed at all? Not really. I still love playing just as I did the first day, you know, that I started when I played when I was probably three years old. It's just as exciting now as it was that first day. It's just so much more that I hear now from other cats that are playing and their approach to the instrument. It's really, really exciting to hear someone fresh and new step up and do something that I've heard before, but do it in such a way that's really, really cool. It's a lot of new cats out here, you know, so many new cats, and it's hard to keep up with them because my focus is trying to maintain with the Matthews Band and trying to learn new things and, and make what I do a little more interesting instead of sounding the same way every night, you know, trying to beef it up a little taste, you know, so. So you saying that perfectly sets up like the number one thing I want to ask you, man. Let me hand you these headphones because I got some audio coming at you to demonstrate right. what I'm talking about. Some Vic Firth headphones, no less. Wow, check it out, nice. I've never seen these before. These are new, man. They're moving up in the world. Wow, Vic. Vic, man. Man, me and Vic hung out one night, man. It was cool. It was a couple years before he passed and man, the dude was amazing. What an amazing cat. Go on. Amazing. Tell yeah. me about that last hang with Vic, man. Hanging with Vic was, was like a dream come true for me because I'd seen him on videos and that kind of thing, you know, when he was doing his thing years back. Fascinating drummer, just amazing drummer, you know. And then to be able to meet and share some dinner with him and, yeah. and share some stories. I was like the little kid in a candy store, you know, when I was hanging out with him. He was just full of all these great, great stories that he had to tell. And I was just there you know, the whole time with. Yeah, you know, mouth wide open. <laughs> I probably look like the biggest nerd. But it was fascinating, fascinating. What a cool guy he was, man. He was like one of the greatest. And that was one of the reasons that I decided to start using his sticks. Yeah. You know, his sticks are just amazing. But just to share those moments with Vic, it made it a little better for me, a little one-on-one, -on -one, I guess. That's say. beautiful, man. Vic is connected to so much good music. Oh, absolutely. And that's one of the great honors of my life, yeah. man, is being a part of that Vic Firth yeah. family, dude. And I share that honor Vic with is, you, man. Vic was, oh, man, bless you. Thank dude, you. so this is 60 Seconds of Music. It perfectly demonstrates what you were saying a second ago. Uh -huh. It's basically the evolution of you playing the same five-second snippet of music, but how your voicing of it changed mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades. Let's throw the cans on and then I'll ask you something about All this, right. man. What would you say? Oh my god. What would you say? What would you say? What would you say? What would you say? <laughs> Why do what you say? Why do what you say? 
Wow. I feel the same way. <laughs> I didn't know there were that many variations of that one lick, you know, of that one section. It's like, whoa. Because I don't think about, you know, I don't think about it, you know. I just do it and try to, you know, keep it interesting. Wow, that's a lot. Thank that's you. hilarious to me that you say that because to get it down to 60 seconds, I had to eliminate like 900 <laughs> other fills that I love <laughs> and I didn't want to throw them away, man. <laughs> So this is what I'm dying to know, man. You've proven you can play the same tune a thousand different ways. <laughs> so what habit or mentality is in place in your life that allows you to keep innovating the language of drumming like that? You know, just again, it all falls back on listening to all the cats that are out there and all the cats that have been there for years, you know, and thinking to myself, what would Tony Williams do here? You know, what would Billy Cobham do here? You know, what would Jack DeJohnette do here? And all of those guys are in my head every second that I'm playing on stage. I'm making sure that I'm focused on Dave and, and everybody else and staying on top of what's going on, but my drumming heroes are with me the whole way, you know, and I'm thinking, how would they approach this? How would they approach that, you know? And then I'm thinking as well, you know, how would I approach it? Out of all the stuff that I've heard, you know, I try and turn it into something that belongs to me. And, you know, it may sound a little bit like someone else, but I'm in there as well. There's a lot of car of Ofrid in there that has a couple words to share with the people that I learned it from, if that makes any sense. So yeah, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Oh, it shows, man. One of the culminations of what does Carter Beaufort have to say? I'm gonna make it religious, man. I brought wow. my childhood Bible here. You recognize this thing? Ay, 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 ay. <laughs> oh my God. This relic, dude, this one piece of media has probably shaped me more as a musician than <laughs> the rest of the universe combined. It's made me wonder in recent years, man, if we just happened to be sitting in that Bearsville studio again and we were shooting a sequel to this, what would you want to hip us to on the drums now? Wow, I don't know. As far as what I do, when people listen to me, a lot of times it's like, what are you thinking about here? What are you thinking about there? You know, a lot of times, like I said, I'm just thinking about how someone else would approach it. I'm hearing other songs in my head, you know, other drummers as they're playing their other songs. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I did when I was younger that I throw in there as well. There's just so many different things. It's hard to really knock it down to one thing. Well, they captured it beautifully, man. I almost hate that I asked you this because it makes me want a sequel to this really bad note. <laughs> you know, like if Deuce Bigelow male gigolo got a sequel in Hollywood, which it did, by the way, then it feels only fair that Under the Table and Drumming should get a sequel to. <laughs> we could call it like uh, Splash Into Me or uh, Before These Crowded Drums. Wow. Every drum, I'll keep going. Uh, the Lily White Drummings, never mind, cut that part out. Why well, is said cut that part out? Don't download that. Stand uh. up and become good at the drum. Okay, that one sucks. <laughs> Away from the being bad at drums. I'm running out you of gas. You have, you have a bunch. Drum tomorrow, that's the one. Drum tomorrow. That's what we'll call it. That's the one. Okay, awesome. Drum tomorrow. If anybody watching this has any ideas for what to call the sequel, just tell me and Carter in the comments and I'll send this to one of you guys. Maybe even signed by the protagonist himself. And... <laughs> but I like that a lot, I like that. Yeah, drum but tomorrow? Yes, yes, Let's drum go. tomorrow. I like that a lot. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, if 
we go on any longer, I'm going to pass out from the joy of this conversation. Man. So, <laughs> let, so let me just, I'll leave us on one last question, man. Sure. As a fellow fan of music, that's come out a lot in this conversation is just your love for music. Can you name a drummer that you've stood in the presence of and he's made you say, damn, right here, right now, I am witnessing one of the all-time greats of drumming? Buddy Rich. I got the opportunity to meet Buddy Rich years ago. I was in college. This was in the 70s, so I'm really dating myself. But I got a chance to hang out and meet with him, and he was one of the coolest cats I'd ever met in my life. He was just so down to earth. And he told me some great stories that I can't tell you, but some stories that were just amazing, amazing. And it turns out that a lot of the drummers that I love are big Buddy Rich fans. His approach to the whole thing was just unbelievable. And I wanted to be just like that, you know, and try and do the same thing. Thing. But uh, yeah, there's so many cats out there, man. So many cats. Dennis Chambers, he's got Lenny White. Oh, Lenny, when he was with Al Di Miola and Stanley Clark and Chick Corea. Oh my God, that was some amazing stuff that he was doing. And if I'm not mistaken, he was snagged out of high school to start playing with Miles Davis. He played the old Stefan Lessard card there. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. And then years after that, I guess, is when he started doing the Chick Corea and Al Di Miola, Stanley Clark thing. Wow. Return to forever. Woo! Ooh, it's heavy stuff. But the stuff that I listen to and that I focus on and the stuff that I love is stuff that still sounds fresh to this day. If not, it's still so much to be learned from all those different groups that I used to listen to. Return to Forever being one. The Miles Davis, when he went from the bebop thing and all of that yeah. and went into the craziness of yes. that stuff was just phenomenal. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Got a chance to hang with Miles a couple times. I was playing with a group called Secrets. He allowed us to open up for him and I got a chance to speak with him and he he was just phenomenal. The coolest cat that I'd ever met in my life. And that particular night, I remember when we finished our set, <clears throat> we packed up and I went upstairs and I was standing upstairs when Miles came on and did his thing. And I was standing kind of like on the top of the building, so to speak, you know, and I was looking down on the stage and Miles, was, he was in the middle of a solo and he stopped his solo right smack dab in the middle. And he turned to his right and looked up at me and took his glasses and pulled them down and looked at me and I was terrified when he did that. I was like, what the hell is he looking at me like that for? And I mean, I wasn't just like level to him. I was up a ways. So he had to really do a lot to know that I was up there. And he did that and just for a few seconds he did that and the band was killing it. They were killing. And he did that and he put his glasses back and went back to his horn, bam, and finished his solo. To this day, even to tell that story, I, it, 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 I, I get this crazy feeling, you know, this, it's scary, it's scary. And that's the one thing that stands out for me, you know, my whole life, really. And that's the thing that Miles did that night. It just blew me away. It gives me goose pimples just to talk about it. <laughs> that story connects so many dots for me about you. It explains so much about your playing, how deeply you lean into music and how much that shit means to right. you. Yeah, yeah. Well, it comes right. out on the instrument, man. Oh, thank you, man. It explains you. that. I'm yeah. glad that you've gotten to have your own version of that feeling about watching the greats because I can say to you without a shred of irony or doubt that one of the great gifts of my life is I've gotten to come to your shows, see you play, and say to myself without that shred of doubt, I am witnessing the greatest to ever oh, touch this man. instrument. Bless you, man. And Thank you can't so talk much. me out of it, man. <laughs> <laughs> That is cool. Uh, that is so cool. Thank you, Thank man. you, bro. Dude, my life is complete now. Um, <laughs> let's end with a ceremonial striking of the cowbell, if you will. I brought yeah. a cowbell. Send us. Peace, dudes. Dope. <laughs> Done. Thank you, dudes. If you're watching, you're the reason this was possible at all. So help me thank you by taking some very cool Carter memorabilia from over the years off my hands. Oh, and one's the most epic banner I've ever seen in my life, and Carter himself wants it hanging on the wall of the next aspiring drummer. Rules are below in the dude's description. Adios, dude chachos.